So this is Senate Government Operations. It is Thursday, April 22nd. And <laughs> today we are looking at what is called um, JRH, Joint Resolution. I don't remember what the JRH actually stands for. Two, it's um, Joint House Resolution. Yeah, yeah. Interesting, it's Joint House Resolution, but it's called JRH. They have the R's and the H's turned around. Anyway, we are looking at that today. It is the resolution that is the um, apologizing and expression, expressing sorrow for the um, complicit um, acts of the General Assembly in the eugenics movement. Um, it has been passed by the House and um, Michael Chernick, the drafter of the resolution has walked us through it. And so what I think I'll do right now is because many of you aren't with us every day, we'll introduce ourselves and then we'll take it away. So I'm Jeanette White from Wyndham County. I'm Anthony Polina from Washington County. Allison Clarkson, Windsor County District. Keisha Rahm, Chittenden County. And um, unfortunately, uh, uh, Senator Brian Collimore could not be with us today because he is at um, a very important uh, meeting in um, Rutland. So he will be joining us the next time we take this up. So um, with that, I think Tom, if, uh, Michael has walked us through the, the resolution. So we are familiar with the words and stuff, but if you just wanna kind of give us a context um, for it, that would be great. Um, sure, thank you so much for, for inviting me and for picking up on this important bill. Um, and I wanted to just say out from the beginning that we're on the floor on the pension issue. And if I get texted away um, on votes, I'll, I'll certainly let you know with about a five second notice. Um, okay. So thank you for, for having us in. So JRH2, as, as, you, as you heard, was uh, a joint resolution between the House and the Senate apologizing for the state sanctioned practices and um, policies related to the eugenics movement in the early 20th century. And we took this up last year prior to COVID. We started work on a version of this. And um, when we left the building, we couldn't pick it up any further. There was no good way of doing that kind of work again. So it was reintroduced this year um, with a different set of sponsors essentially, but it was the same language uh, that, we, that we left with last year and then spent um, our time working through Oh, what was unique? Um, the state has never apologized. None of, no department of the state has ever apologized for actions that it's taken um, for policies, even, uh, even if they're dissimilar to the eugenics movement. Uh, but we took this up because it was clear that the actions that we promulgated through our work as a general assembly, not us personally, but this institution, uh, starting in 1912, really, allowed for the um, institutionalization, sterilization, and separation of Vermonters from their families. And we did this as a state policy, a state sanctioned policy. And that work really hurt the people, hurt the affected communities. It discontinued family lines. And they are policies that actually have lived on in some way throughout the decades. Uh, we've seen this through um, some of the actions through the Waterbury State Hospital, through Battle Royal, through Brandon Training Center, um, but also in state policies of how we treat uh, people with disabilities, um, how long it took to recognize indigenous people in the state of Vermont. Um, there's many different reasons that many different pieces of this puzzle that continued on for, for years and years and years after, after the eugenics survey, which was based at UVM, ended in 1936. So um, taking on what's, an, what's called a public apology was something new and different for us. And even though it's in this resolution form, we, were, we were, brought this bill, brought this as a bill, and um, we really had to figure out how to handle it. And one of the first things you had we had to learn was well what's a public apology and, and public apology is an acknowledgement of wrongdoing 
It's an admission of responsibility. Um, it is a sincere apology. And it is a commitment to do something about it uh, in the coming months and years. And the second piece that was really important was to listen um, to, the, to the affected, to, to people from the affected communities, the descendants of people who we hurt most directly, who are still uh, suffering in some way from the actions that we took. And that was a broad swath of people. It was folks from our indigenous and Abenaki communities. It was uh, the people from the disabled communities. It was people from our French American or French Canadian communities. Uh, and listening was probably some of the most moving testimony that I've heard um, in the time that I've been in the building because, because not solely because of the people who were bringing them forward, but because I belong to that system now. Um, and it was something that we're all capable of doing simply through our work here. And it was incredibly um, difficult to put our emotions aside with the work and also the reactions of saying, but wait, that happened so long ago. What did we have to do with that? And the fact is, is that laws stay on the books for years and years and years until we take them off. Um, uh, most of you who are in, in this in this picture here, um, as senators, probably served at a time when uh, Representative Donahue worked about ten years ago to get language that was still related to how we, in, how we treated and how we looked at people with disabilities in particular. Um, that only came off our books ten years ago. And uh, the laws regarding sterilization only came off our books, perhaps in the early 1980s. So, so th this is what we did, again, as a general assembly. And so um, by taking it up, we committed to really trying to start a process of righting that wrong. And we needed to um, hear the stories. We needed to hear the histories. We needed to respect them. We needed to acknowledge that um, in, in my case, I'm a almost 60 year old white male who is serving in this, in this body. Um, so I'm coming at this from a different, from a way different perspective. And yet um, we needed to make sure we took this seriously. Someone accused us at one point of doing something that was a feel good piece of legislation. And I can assure you that this was not a feel good piece of legislation. It wasn't a feel good for anybody who testified. It wasn't a feel good for anybody who, who in my committee in particular, who put their heart into making sure that we did this as well as we possibly could. We worked with Michael Chernick to make sure that we, um, we're doing the language correctly. We listen to historians. Um, we listen to there's there's a plethora of story of of essays from the Vermont history journals that we used as research. Um, that's all we that's all available. We can either provide you a, a quasi bibliography and 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 whatnot. Um, we did our research on what these policies were. Um, we actually had a member of our committee whose grandfather um, served in the Senate in 1925 when one of the bills was put forward. It failed in the House that year, um, but her grandfather voted for, for the eugenics survey in 1925, and it became a, you know, just a real, a, a real piece for her that, would, you know, that, that, that her family, um, that she had a connection in something in, as, as negative as this. Um, and so we worked... Um, I think we did our work with as many people as we as as we reached out to who came in to advise us in in the direction that we needed to go. Um, of course, I see the state archivist here, um, who we did not talk to uh, during this process, and and that perhaps was an oversight. But we had the information from the Vermont Historical Society. We had. Um, but what, what was it we were apologizing for? You know, I mean, again, we, we had state sanction policies, and I think you heard this in the, in the apology from Michael that listed off a number of direct legislation, some of which did not pass, but some of which did. And that legislation, as we know from our work these days, reflects kind of the popular will at the time and, and, and in how it takes time 
in the case of the eugenics survey and appropriating the funds and, and, and putting into statute uh, allowing, allowing sterilization, so-called voluntary sterilizations to happen, it, look at the process it took. It was introduced uh, and it failed. And then it was introduced again and it failed again. And then the groups who were most interested in seeing it move forward retrenched, did their work. They, they formed this Vermont Commission on Rural Life. They issued a report that basically said, yes, if we could do this, if we could do this, this sterilization program included with our existing uh, separation and institutionalization program. And oh, by the way, we could do the sterilization with those people who are institutionalized. Uh, and they made they stay, they they kind of homogenized it to a point where the legislature felt that they could pass it. And as we know, in retrospect, it was probably one of the most painful eras of our time. Um, our the records that we were sh that were shared with us um, talked about two hundred and fifty three sterilizations. Um, though there's there's some evidence that there were more. Uh, we know about the separate the children being separated from families. We know the adults being separated from the families. Uh, we know about the institutionalization. At one point, the wash uh, the the Waterbury Hospital had over fifteen hundred to seventeen hundred people in it, um, and they weren't there simply because uh, they were insane. There, there were other issues. There was poverty issues that were involved with this. Um, in fact, poverty was the umbrella over over all of this. And um, so it became an issue of Vermont supporting essentially um, racist ideas that affected a substantial portion of our population. And so when our committee took it on, we tried to understand, we, we listened, and we tried to put forth words that resulted in what we felt was a sincere apology that can only be complete, not only with the approval of the Senate, we hope, um, but with a public apology and then with a continuation of some of the other policies that we've been working on uh, as a body to um, lift up the affected populations in whatever way we can. And, and, and Due to the nature of our work, I mean, there's a, there's bits and pieces everywhere, but and it's not a process that happens just in one year. But this piece here is really important as a start for us as a body, as a general assembly, to say not only to the affected communities, but to the state of Vermont that we're capable of doing something wrong. We did do something wrong, and we are not going to do something like this again. And so it was, it was um, an 11-0 vote out of my committee, uh, Representative Rahm and, Rep and uh, sorry, Senator Rahm and Senator Clarkson know my committee well. And to get an 11-0 vote is, um, is an improvement over most of our votes. And we, and a House general bill got a 146-0 vote in the House. So, um, I think that's what I, I think in, in, you know, just in a short, as a short um, intro, I, I would leave it there. Certainly any of the information that's available on that we use for research is available either through our website or we can provide you links. Um, my floor report was, um, is available and you can, I can send it to you at any time if you wanted to see that too, uh, but I'll leave it there. So I see that Senator Rahm has a question, but I'm going to ask you a very dry procedural question. One of the questions that came up earlier um, among our committee was, if should we choose to make any changes to this? What is the process? Does it get treated like a bill and it comes back to you? Is yes. that the way? Okay. All right. It is, it is, it is a bill. It is a bill. Okay. Um, it's just not, it's just between the House and the Senate, though. It does not go to the, um, the executive branch. Right. Okay. I just, I just wanted to ask that. So I see Senator Rahm has a question. Yeah. Um, thanks, Representative Stevens. I think people who know me know I'd, you know, be one of the first to applaud when we name something as explicitly racist. But I was just surprised, you know, that you didn't also include sexist and ableist since you know this was a policy that was largely carried out 
against women who were seen as unfit to raise children. Um, and there was very much a component of, you know, judging someone's mental and physical ability involved in eugenics. So can you talk about how you tried to honor those pieces? Because I was surprised not to see more about, you know, the impact on women and people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you for that. It's, um, and I, I don't, we certainly considered the, those elements and felt in the end that what we had written was inclusive of that. And I, and, but I, I hear your, your um, point. Um, we felt like we needed to, um, really it was an interesting balance between being careful being right and being honest and and you know and in the case of and in the case of ableism and um, sexism when we discussed it I think the, the it was it came up in the in my floor report it came up in the testimony but when it came up to some of the witnesses who were going to be this you know from the disability community it didn't um, come up as a need for them to have it expressed that way. And so we didn't, um, we just felt like the language that we included was, um, was inclusive. Okay, any other questions for Representative Stevens? Yeah. Sorry, I mean, some of these came up with poor, you know, Michael Chernick and it was like, you know, that's a question for the committee. So, so I've been trying to sort of save them or, or remember some of them. Um, you know, it, it, it felt a little bit like if, you, if we just read through the language, you know, a lot of it was kind of blaming buildings, right? Like it named a lot of buildings where things took place. It didn't necessarily name the agencies and the departments that carried out those policies. We, we became interested in the governor who vetoed it and, you know, what happened there and, so it just, you know, and, and it really definitely calls out Perkins, you know, which is certainly he was, he, he played a role. Um, but I just, we, you know, Michael encouraged us to talk to you about the interplay there. I mean, some of my committee colleagues were saying maybe, you know, it's just we're owning the legislature's responsibility. But I think it's helpful sometimes for us to acknowledge that some of these agencies and departments still exist, you know, and, and carry this out. And that could be a healing and important thing for Vermonters to acknowledge that they need to own and acknowledge this past. Um, yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't see it as that we were just discussing buildings alone. Um, I think we, I, I think that we were clear that it was our policies. You know, we can't, apologize for UVM. UVM made an apology, whether it's sufficient or not for some people is, is up in the air, but we felt like we could not apologize for UVM. We could apologize and name uh, Dr. Perkins because he was, he was a uh, primary mover in, in the movement. Uh, he was essentially a, an advocate or a lobbyist for the movement in the state house. And he helped, he helped write the legislation. Um, but that was material that I think um, we covered more in the floor report than in the apology. It was, it was um, you know, we, we decided that apologizing for the, for the General Assembly's actions was what we could do in a public apology. Um, the, the idea that we could take on even what the executive branch may have approved simply by signing, we couldn't do that. This wasn't apology. This is not an apology from the full state of Vermont. This is an apology from the General Assembly. And so we were, um, and not to protect anybody, you know, not, not to, not to, um, not to say that, that people, I mean, the people that there were people who were affiliated with UVM in the house who were very, very nervous about, about even having UVM mentioned at all. And, but UVM's, UVM's, the fact that we fund UVM, the fact that we approved legislation um, makes UVM uh, 
a part of the story, even in this apology. You know, I, I, the names are um, like naming who the superintendent of the state hospital was at the time we deemed was not important because again, it was our, it, it, was, it was important again in the floor report in the discussed history, but in the apology itself, we, we chose to say that these were our actions and they resulted in this. And so, you know, we, we felt we got there. I mean, you're free to interpret it differently, but you know, we're, we felt we got there with, with what we were trying to say that we, you know, the state sanctioned practices and policies did this. Um, and that was the approach we took with it. So I guess my, my follow-up question, cause I'm, maybe I'm being really dense is I'm wondering if I'm reading between the lines, did you take testimony from the administration or the agencies that had been involved and they felt that they did not want to be named and they were very explicit about that? Or you just assumed that it was important to only name the legislature's role? Um, we were taking it from the legislature's perspective. I mean, we, again, again, we, on the piece of paper, on the, on the apology itself, backed with I mean, we put a lot of effort into the, in the idea of what could be in an apology and what can be in the, um, in the floor report. And the floor report's a fuller explanation or a fuller discussion of, of those, of those um, elements of, of what you're asking about. They're just, but, in the, but the apology itself, no, we didn't reach out to the administration um, at all. It, again, this was not about, this was a joint resolution between the House and Senate and, and you know, we're responsible. We felt the responsibility to take on that which we were responsible for, which was an interplay between all of these things. Okay, I, I, we, we had this kind of discussion earlier and I think it's something that we will look at. I tend to think that we can only apologize for ourselves. I, I kind of agree with, with that approach. If others want to apologize for their actions, but we are the ones that wrote the legislation that produced the practices. And yeah. so, so thank you, Representative Stevens. Um, I think what I'm going to do, oh, did we just lose? We just lost Carol. We did just lose Carol. Yeah. I'm going to come and back. We have, in. We did, have she have a, did she have a time frame challenge? Gail, did she have a time ch challenge that we didn't know about? Not that I know of. Uh, not that and, I was informed of. And we have two Carols on the agenda, and I'm not sure which Carol that was. We have Carol McGranahan. And Carol Irons, and it her tag just that was, said that was Carol McGranahan who okay, who thank, was you. Here. And, uh, thank you. So I have to get back to the floor. Okay. Um, I'm good. happy to answer any questions, or like I said, if you need information, please reach out to me or our committee assistant, and we'll get you the information that you might need. And if you'd be thank kind you. of send us your floor report, which sounds like it was sort of complementary to the resolution work, so uh, I think that would be great. Yeah, I'll email that to Gail. Um, thank you, sir. Thank you. And right. good, luck, good luck with pensions. Yep, thank you so much. So I think what we'll do is jump to Judy. Um, One more <laughs> note about witnesses. Carol Irons' uh, testimony was uh, weather dependent because oh. she needed to get to a place where she could uh, participate video and she is not able to make it today. Okay, so we can hear from her next week when we take it up. And how about Doug Bent? Uh, as far as I know, he will be joining us. Okay, we did okay great. did some testimony as well. All right. <laughs> so can we perhaps jump to Ms. Dow here and um, hear what you have to tell us? Sure, thank you. Um, it's nice to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, and. Um, this has been a journey for me because I worked on this 10 years ago when it first came up. Um, it's kind of dear and near to my heart. 
I have a lot to say, so I've written it down so I can quickly read it um, and stay in within a decent time frame for you. Okay. My name is Judy Dow. I am a descendant of the largest family targeted by the Vermont Eugenics Survey. I am French Canadian and a Beniki. My family charts were first started in Cold Spring Harbor, New York at the headquarters for the National Eugenics Movement. We were the only family in the Vermont Eugenics records to follow that path. This, the, the files traveled to Vermont and eventually recorded 623 people in one family, my family. 23 of these people um, were recorded as having Huntington's chorea, a hereditary disease that is usually passed to generation after generation. We were also identified as French Indian. This subjective diagnosis occurred without any medical re records and to today nobody in the family has this hereditary disease. These people that were diagnosed were about 20 to 30 years older than the average lifespan of someone who was having, who has Huntington's chorea and, and actually live. Many of these families were sterilized in an effort to prevent the spread of Huntington's chorea. And just to tag on to what Tom said, um, when he said there was 253 plus documentation of more, the reason for that is um, if you were sterilized in an institution, um, they made out a cer certificate saying you were sterilized, but there needed to be two doctors to sign it. So if you were sterilized in the general population, two doctors would agree to do it. It didn't necessarily mean there was a certificate that was created. So there's actually many more than, than the records reflect. Um, my hopes are that this example shows you how subjective and damaging the Vermont Eugenics Survey was and why all eugenics programs in this country were later declared a pseudoscience and exactly why there is so much historical trauma that circles around these, these issues. I appreciate all the hard work that the House Committee put into this apology, but I still have some strong concerns around inaccurate, painful, and missing statements now as I have before. Many of my suggestions were added to the apology, but a few were not. I was told, quote, that was simply because of the relationship many of the House Committee had with Don Stevens and that they wanted to maintain that relationship. This relationship comes at an expense of accurate history recorded in this apology. An apology for trauma caused by, to a group of people should not inflict more traumas, yet JRH two does exactly that as currently written. Although Vermont participated in the progress towards modernity, it failed to reach the level of pros prosperity and centralization achieved in neighboring states and by 1880 remained primarily rural and unindustrialized. These shortcomings were attributed to the internal political struggles between two distinct groups of Vermonters, which can be described in Burlington as those living on the hill or the elite and those living along the interval on, and on rural farms or the poor. Fears were prevalent from the old quote, old Yankee stock of losing control of their power by the sheer numbers of the French Canadians moving to Vermont due to the 1890 law of Le Duc, Le Duc <laughs> I'll say it in English, the 12 children of, in Quebec. Um, and this was a law that if you had 12 children, we would give you 100 acres of land. By 1895, they'd given away a half a million acres under Le Loi de Deux Enfants. And so they, they amended the law to be $100. And during that time, they moved here to Vermont, took over abandoned farms and worked our mills. Taking a stroll down Church Street at this time, would one would most likely hear French spoken due to the fact that during the 20s and 30s, 65% of Vermonters living in Vermont spoke French, not English. And anyone living north of Route 2 that had a French surname was most likely French Indian descent. This was frightening to the progressive Vermonters and the political control, and the political control they maintained. Henry Perkins' written records reflect a strong hatred towards French Canadians for this reason. The people on the hill, Burlington's elite, wanted the progressive movement, the progressive movement towards doing away with the low-income, hard scrabble farmers that all 
at one time lived in rural Vermont and were rapidly moving into the Queen City. After 1910, Vermont's agricultural acreage began to decline. Many of those hard scrabble people moved to Burlington. Local people referred to the rocky soils of Vermont as hard scrabble, a place that is difficult to make a li living farming due to so many rocks. Hard scrabble became a term that has come to denote poverty and destitution here in Vermont. In addition to such maladies as physical and mental retardations, quote, Perkins defined pauperism as a defective trait. The problem then was not so much a lack of commerce, but rather the commerce was founded on the uh, whether the commerce was founded on the values of those living on the hill, or hard work will get you power and prestige, or those living in the interval uh, and surrounding the interval, which was to work for a need. Early in 1925, Henry Perkins organized the eugenic survey in the state of Vermont. Perkins tried to pass the sterilization bill in 27, but was unsuccessful. Successful. However, in an effort to protect the work of the Vermont country life, Perkins pulled away from the sterilization bill until 1931, the very year Rural Vermont, A Plan for the Future was published. He did, however, write a, and push through the state legislation or legislature the marriage restriction law of 1929 during the Vermont Commission on Country Life's construction period. And finally, Perkins got the sterilization bill, in 30, bill passed in 31. There needs to be recognition listed in the whereas section of the history stating the impact of this marriage restriction law of 1929 in which it was illegal to marry a person that was poor without consent from the overseer of the poor. And by state law, his word could never be challenged or mentally ill. Considering the resources that eugenics used to determine if someone was poor or mentally ill were subjective, you can see how damaging this could have been to the folks living there at that time. The slogan of the early 20th century eugenics was breed better men. And to Perkins, property was a defect, one in which Vermont needed to correct. I'm telling you all this history because being poor is the one thing every person listed in a negative way within the Vermont eugenics records have in common. The eugenics records are divided into two basic categories, one being the five main families living around the interval in Bur Burlington. These files were referred to as completed files. Roughly six or more generations in these families were listed in each of the five families, <clears throat> excuse me, totaling somewhere around 5,000 names. These families were studied in great depth. And I'm telling you all this because I heard it come up as a question in a previous meeting you had. These five families were intermarried many times over and were listed in the rec records as a mixture of, quote, French Canadian, French Indian, mulatto, colored, and Negro. Never once in all 44 boxes is the word of any key mentioned. Of course, once again, the records are subjective, but there are many letters written to reservations asking about the identity of one family or another, and not res one response comes back to the Vermont Eugenic Survey saying that someone is from a particular reservation notified. Of the approximately 202 families mentioned under these five main families in the records, only five mentioned the word Indian blood or French Indian. So to use the word Abenaki in this apology would be a slap in the face to the many people who were targeted simply because they were poor or of some other Indian descent other than Abenaki or merely French Canadian. It elevates them to a status that is that true history doesn't reflect and erases many other ethnic groups. There is a reading into the records by some people today that isn't actually in the records of the past. This has to be corrected. And of the historians um, that were in the house, all of them agreed that the records never mentioned the word of Enneke. Vermont Eugenics Survey represented many different studies one being the ethnic studies done by Ellen Anderson. 
there is anything, there isn't anything listed in the ethnicity study conducted by Ellen Anderson, assistant director of the Vermont Eugenics Survey for Native Americans or for Indian. Rather, the ethnicities listed in this study reflect English, Old Americans, German, French, Canadian, split into two categories, those that spoke French and those that spoke English, Irish, Italians, Greeks, Syrians, and Jews. However, as Anderson explains, quote, here again, Burlington tip, tip, typifies the state as whole for the largest single immigrant group in the city is French Canadian, which is exactly why the largest targeted group was French Canadian. If they were targeted, had if they had been targeting Native Americans or specifically a Beneke, she would have mentioned them in her book, We Americans, and she does not mention them once. Let me give you several examples. One currently recognized Abenaki woman frequently states her two aunts were in the eugenics records. She is absolutely correct. They were in the records. However, her family was not targeted because she was Abenaki. Actually, her fi files do not even reflect the word Indian or Abenaki at all. What the files do reflect is that one of her aunts was in prison and the second aunt divorced and moved to Burlington and coincidentally lived in one of the tenement houses in Burlington that were frequently targeted because poor French Canadians lived there. According to the Vermont Eugenics Survey's records, this particular family was targeted simply because they were poor and her children were listed as delinquent and unsupervised children due to the fact that this was a single mother and she had to work to support them. In a second family that acknowledges themselves as a Beniki family today, they maintained a life of in and out of poor farms and state prison. Their story tells of their targeting because they were poor and that members of their family frequently ended up in jail. Somehow the story of both of these families got twisted to reflect they were targeted because they were a Beniki. The records do not reflect this. It would be inaccurate to state that history does recognize the Abenaki either past or present in these records. This program was not about targeting Abenaki. It was about targeting the dependent, delinquent, and defective people. I'm not saying there were not a few Abenaki families in these files because I know they were poor too. What I'm saying is that they were the minority and not recognized as a Benic at all. Rather, the five families were listed as possible, quote, possibly having Indian blood, colored blood, Negroid, or French Canadian, or from Mohawk reservations. The focus on these so called Abenaki people from the records is of elevating them to the position of majority at the expense of others in these records, especially since they may not have self-identified as a Beneke at the time, but rather Mohawk, Algonquin, or some other indigenous tribe. An apology should be given fairly to all ethnic groups represented in the records. Nobody should be elevated to a higher status except perhaps the French Canadians because they were the majority of ethnic groups listed. The remaining families were related, related by marriage to the five main families. These families were never investigated and they were listed as incomplete files. If your family name is listed in these records, you were never investigated past the marriage into one of the five main families. The file just exists in the records. There was never time in the Vermont eugenics programs to finish these incomplete files incomplete records. They closed operations before they could become completed. In addition, approximately 1,000 names came from prisons and other institutions, such as my grandmother, who was scooped up off the street, sent to Waterbury State Hospital, where abouts unbeknown to my family. After five years missing, my grandfather filed for a divorce because he believed the family had been abandoned and my father at the age of five was placed in an orphanage. My father learned when he was 88 years old that his mother had lived until she, he was 16 years old and he never knew it. The traumas of the past have come forward to the present generations. Please stop the cycle. My recommendations are, e are e either to change the following or make a, de a 
and addition. Mention in the whereas section, the marriage restriction laws of 1929 written by Henry Perkins and the impacts on supposed poor and mentally ill. And I say supposed because poor was a subjective term and, um, and mentally ill was also subjective. So you could be termed defective if you merely had hemorrhoids. Um, on line 12, um, in the whereas section reflect all the institutions or make it generic. For instance, if you add the Rutland Reformatory and the others, it might bring uh, prominence to this history to the communities where these um, institutions belong. And the third one is a change on page two, line seven. Whereas state sanctioned eugenics policies targeted Vermonters of French Canadian heritage persons of mixed ethnicity, poor and persons with a disability and a perceived disability. Thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you. Um, that was quite a lot, thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> um, no, 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 it was, it was great, thank you. Um, could I just ask you one question at the <coughs> very beginning and I, I don't know if I misheard or, but you said that um, when you talked to the House Committee, you talked about making some of these changes. And then you said something about um, people wanting to stay on the good side of, and I didn't, I didn't get that. Could you? Yeah, um, so I wanted the word Beneke removed from the records. Number one, because they weren't the majority. Number two, because they're not even mentioned in the records. And I felt that it elevated them above every other group, ethnic group that was targeted. And I was told that they couldn't do that because they had developed relationships with Don and Don wanted the word Abeniki in there. And who is Don? Don Stevens. Who is Don Stevens? The chief of the Nohige. Oh, okay, thank you. I, I didn't know that, so th that's helpful, okay. And may I ask a, a, a favor of Judy? Yes, please. Judy, if you'd be kind enough to send us your testimony, that would be uh, sure. terrific because I don't see it posted today. Uh, and so that would be helpful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm not that clever with technology. <laughs> <laughs> you could, if you have it written, you could, if you're not clever with technology, you could put it in an envelope with a stamp on it and send it to- Yeah, uh, I can attach it and just send it to- Okay. To Keisha or somebody and- you send it to Gail. Our assistant, Gail Carrick. Okay. okay. And she'll get it to us. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Senator Rahm. Um, thanks so much, Judy. You know, it's in the papers for others who want to refer back, but you've you've done a lot of work to hold current state agencies accountable for continuing to bear the names of known eugenicists to in some way celebrate them, including a recent request to change the name of the Children's Book Award um, and, and uh, going before the Department of Libraries. And I just wonder, um, do you feel like this kind of apology gives you more of what you need to make the case to those agencies? Um, or would you prefer that we took more time to bring in state agencies to see how they you know, feel about being named as having some legacy that they're recovering from of administering eugenics? Well, I was under the impression that um, there was a concern about the length. And so some things were left out because it would be too lengthy. I don't, they tried to condense it as you would say things. Personally, I believe there is a lot of state agencies that have a legacy here and need need to acknowledge that less legacy. So the Department of Libra Libraries, when I first went to get the name change of the Dorothy Canfield Fisher Book Award, who was an avid eugenicist, served on three subcommittees for the eugenics and made publications for the Department of Tourism to encourage um, 
quote, people who were professionally trained to use their brain as a living to move to Vermont and have a second home. Those who were um, not, uh, who those who were in manufacturing and um, banking would not find common ground here. And she was referring to French Canadians in manufacturing and Jews in banking. Um, and so the publications that the Vermont Department of Tourism was putting out were, were terrible and racist. And the Department of Ed today still follows programs that were set up in rural Vermont and written, which was created by the Vermont Country Life uh, Commission on Country Life was created as one of those subcommittees by the Vermont Eugenics Survey. And, um, and so then that gets into the, the prisons, it gets into agriculture, it gets into um, education. Um, all of these different areas were directly co connected with eugenics. And so I think it would be very beneficial to, um, to make that public. However, I don't know if that's true, that there is a limit to the length of this apology, but um, it seems to me like it should be addressed. Um, Representative Stevens brought up the UVM apology and he said, some people don't see it as an apology. And I don't, because here's what they say. They say, according, um, they apologize for this, we since have sincere remorse for support given to the eugenic survey. That's it. That's the only apology. There's no, there's no apology for the programs. There's no apology for following through, only um, for the support they gave for the program. And so that's why I don't believe this was a strong apology. And I think it needs to go much deeper. So, so I, I'm going to, um, I think that uh, I, I do have some sense that we can't apologize for those other institutions like the departments and the agencies and the Department of Libraries and stuff, but we can, we can put something in here, I would think, that says that our actions, our, what we did led them to act in this in this way. I, I think that I don't know that there's any kind of a limit on length here. And this certainly isn't a very lengthy one. So I've seen resolutions that are much longer than this. So but but I think that we can yeah. we can say that our actions led to many of these other things that aren't mentioned in here. Yeah, I know it's a, a game of semantics. I, I clearly saw that um, happening in the house. Um, and, and however it works out, I do believe these agencies should, um, it should be brought to the attention of the public that there was this trickle down effect. Mm -hmm. Maybe we can encourage the um, administration to um, also offer an apology for uh, not the, well, their role right now, but that they 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 were responsible just as we were responsible. Well, I the don't... one the one thing I asked was, um, so like, where does it say all this? Where does it say um, there has to be a limit in in the length? And where does it say? that there has to, you can't apologize for somebody else. Um, and nobody could give me an answer to that. Well, I, yeah. I, I, I think what our chair is saying is that we, we, we want to apologize for the General Assembly. I think that's the objective here. We can't, I don't think you can ever apologize for somebody else. We can apologize for our own actions and we, we have to own them. And so I think this apology owns those actions. And as much as our work enabled the state government to carry it out in these various agencies and departments, that we can say. But we, as a, as a General Assembly, are apologizing for our actions, which led to those actions. I understand that. 
Yeah. But I don't think it says that anywhere that you can't. I just think that's a general feeling that that we have. I don't think that it there's nothing that says I when my kids are little, I constantly apologize for them. <laughs> so um, <laughs> don't we all? <laughs> but um, and I still do. But um, anyway, so I don't think that it says we can't. And I don't think there's anything that talks about length. I've never heard of any such thing. So. Okay, thank you. Um, but thank if you, you, yes, Senator Rahm. Oh, I'll let you finish your thought. Sorry, it was. Oh no, I was just going to say that if you send us that, and then if you have actual language around both, um, and I can't guarantee you that we'll put it in or we won't, but around the marriage uh, restriction law, and um, the, and mentioning some of these other trick tr trickle down. Um, like, like the Vermont Country Life Report and the um, the whatever those other um, agencies and institutions were, if you can send language about that so that we can actually look at that language, that would be great. Okay, um, I I would be happy to do that. Um, yes, yeah, so that um, the marriage languages. Um, do you remember having to go get a license to get married at the city clerk's office or the town clerk's office? Yes. Yes, but they didn't okay. ask me if I was poor or mentally right. Well, right. But back then, um, there were fines for the town clerks and the city clerks who didn't, um, if they knew they were poor and didn't ask for uh, a letter from the overseer of the poor, there were fines for those people. Wow. Um, and this bill spills that all out. I'll send you the bill. Oh, that would um, be great. Um, but, and, and so consequently, if you were defined as poor, but your values were different, that controlled whether you could get married or not. And state law um, deemed that the overseer of the poor um, could never be questioned his authority can never be questioned. And so it was um, a restrictive mm. um, law that impacted many people because they often targeted people they believed to not be married and institutionalized and sterilized them simply because they couldn't find a marriage certificate for them in the files. Um, I can think of one family, I've been studying these records for over 35 years. And I can think of one family, they went after this family um, terribly. The, the woman they were going after was described as beautiful. And, um, and she kept having children with various different husbands. They couldn't find the marriage certificates. And so they followed them all the way to Belfast, Maine and wrote to Maine and Maine quickly sterilized them based on what Vermont said in their letter that they weren't legally married. And many years later, family members found the marriage certificates. They were there. So I just think that should be brought to someone's attention and listed in the whereas as, as prominently as some of the others. Senator Rum. So I, th I think this is part of what Tanya will address as well, but you know, I think it's nice sometimes to, even if it's just on the record and it doesn't show up in the resolution to have a history of the complexity of the debate of the time. And Judy, you're such a great storyteller and historian, you know, we're, we're starting to learn that the governor, you know, vetoed the bill originally, there may have been interesting voices who opposed the legislation. And do you think, do you, from your perspective, have you seen any stories worth kind of highlighting in that regard to show that it's uncomfortable in history sometimes to speak up against, you know, what people thought was good social policy? Well, that was part of what the problem was 10 years ago when they started to address this there were people who were putting things in it to ha that had personal agendas. And one of those personal agendas was the fact that the largest people or institution 
that uh, contested what was happening was the Catholic Church. Mm. And, um, and so those views were being um, melded into the, the attempt 10 years ago. Um, so, so what you're saying is one of, the, one of the largest organizations that stood in opposition to eugenics was the Catholic Church. And maybe the, was, you, was the governor Catholic? I mean, so, so they the kind of- No, uh, he, was, he was told by lawyers that it could um, um, turn into a lawsuit. Oh. So he denied it or what did, whatever it's called, vetoed, vetoed it um, because he was afraid of lawsuits. Hmm. Huh. I guess his mama didn't raise no fool. <laughs> <laughs> well, at least the Catholic Church is consistent. Yeah. It's, isn't it also true that, you know, he was afraid of lawsuits, but when this was going on, I'd be curious to hear whether there were people who challenged it during the time it was happening. And, you know, why weren't there lawsuits? That kind of thing. I mean, why didn't somebody try to stop it? Well, because the primarily the people they were targeting were people who didn't have voices. They were my yeah, friends. Yeah. Well, Good they had point. No money and, and no money. No, no money. Right. No money and, and less education. I mean, they were, yep. they didn't necessarily know they could. Right. right. And, and remember 65% of Vermont spoke French. That, that is an amazing statistic, Judy, that stick and, that I, was cool. and, that and was cool. I struggle with all my writing and speaking today because my first language was French. So how long was that true for? When did that end? The, that? Uh, when did it I, turn? I don't when? know when exactly, but I know in the 70s and um, there was a lack of um, the opportunity to take French in some schools. <laughs> so it slowly started to fade away um, that direct connection with Canada and the French language. So committee, what I'm going to do is um, switch to Carol. And um, Carol, we had two Carols on the agenda for today. And I understand you are Carol McGranigan. That's correct. Okay. McGranahan. I'm not. McGranahan. I'm not. A, I'm not a, OK. Uh, I send apologies from Carol Iron. She wasn't able to travel to my house today. Um, we heard that, yeah. Yeah, so I, I'm hoping my connection will stay. I've already been bumped off once, but I live out in the wilds of Orange, so connections are not always that great. Yes, we, we, your senator has equally challenging. Um, <laughs> I think so. Yeah. So anyway, um, first of all, thank you all for um, allowing me time on your schedule. Um, I wanted to say that I've given testimony a couple of times um, in the House Committee regarding the apology. And it has been extremely educational for me, but it's also I look at the people and the work that they've done, the time they put in, the research, the, the effort, the concern, um, the sincerity. And I really want to say that that really struck me that being a member of the Vermont Com um, Commission on Native American Affairs, we had talked about, you know, should we ask for an apology? Should we get that in process? <laughs> And a lot of the people on the commission thought it would just be words and basically people would dust off their hands and move on. Um, so at that point in time, that was a little over a year ago, we didn't pursue it. But then when we heard that there was actually something taking place, um, we got more involved. And my very first visit at the House Committee was amazing. The, the sincerity that I felt there and um, the way that the people were asking questions and asking for testimony really struck me as being, this is, 
they want to get it right. And so part of my being here today is that I want to express thanks for everyone um, for all of the time and effort that you've you've gone to to also um, be a part of this process. I did send my testimony to um, Gail and it's out there, but I would like to read it um, also. Uh, and they all have to forgive me if I get a little emotional because that happens. But anyway, I'm Abenaki and my family was named in the eugenics survey. I want to outline how this has impacted the six generations since and what it means for all the generations to come. Our culture was a land-based one with a rich oral history. When settlers arrived, our lives were changed forever. The many threads that wove the tapestries of our identities were caught, destroyed by disease, war, loss of our land, forced assimilation, legislation, and documentation, culminating in the eugenic survey. These are all different forms of genocide, but all are just as effective in erasing who we were as a unique people. Last year, I heard one legislator voice concerns that genocide is an ugly word and felt it did not describe what the eugenics survey did. I'll share the definition of genocide as stated in international law, article two of the United Nations convention held in 1946. Genocide is any of the following acts committed with the intent to destroy in whole or in part a national, ethnic, racial, racial or religious group as such. Number one, killing members of the group. Number two, causing serious bodily or mental harm to members of the group. Number three, deliberately inflicting on the group conditions of life calculated to bring about its physical destruction in whole or in part. Number four, imposing measures intended to prevent births within the group. Number five, forcibly transferring children of the group to another group. Documentation exists which shows the eugenic survey embraced forced sterilization, institu yeah, institutionalization, and forcibly taking children to be placed in homes which were not Apenaki. These actions were all part of the eugenics survey, but also existed long before and after. This genocide happened and was embraced by the legislature at the time. But how does one measure the loss of the connection to our ancestors, history, language, culture, spiritual beliefs, our identity as Apenaki? My own family roots were hidden and lost as names were anglicized and changed, and it became unsafe to acknowledge or teach Apenaki culture and language. Through institutionalization and sterilization driven by the eugenic survey, some would never know the joy of having children, effect effectively killing all future generations. If my family had not hidden their roots, I might not be here today and in turn my children, grandchildren and their children would not exist. As we grapple with rediscovering our Apenaki history and who we were and are, the threads must be picked up one by one and rewoven into the tapestry. But like any repair, it will always be there as a stark reminder of the damage caused by others who claimed our homeland as theirs. I believe an apology has to include the acceptance of responsibility for the eugenics survey and to ensure actions will be taken to begin the process of reconciliation and healing for all. It's hard for me to, um, to look at how my family was affected and to know that if the survey had continued, I might, I might not be here. So when I look at other families who um, 
I had members who were sterilized or or children were taken and I and I think that the impact of generation every generation afterward is going to be um, impacted in this way. I don't feel naming people as Apanaki or Abenaki or French Canadian or Indian or whatever puts one group above another. It's just recognizing that all groups here were affected, including the original people. So I guess I'll leave it at that, but if you have questions, I'll gladly answer them. Thank you. Thank you. Um, does anybody have a question right offhand? Well, I hit Senator Rom. I just want to, it, it feels like a good an important time to thank both Judy and Carol for what can be really yeah. painful testimony if this is, you know, an experience that's anywhere near your family or community. Um, so I just want to appreciate both of you for your courage in speaking today. And in speaking clearly to the House members also over the past. Um, it is. I am, <clears throat> when you were talking, Carol, about um, kind of the, the definition of genocide and um, one of the things that struck me in the resolution, I was just, and I hadn't, hadn't really thought of this before, but there's nothing in here that frames what the eugenics movement was. I mean, what, what it was that in, in fact was designed to, um, to uh, eliminate people who, uh, I think as Judy put it, who were delinquent, defective, and dependent. That 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 was the that was the goal, and that isn't anywhere in here. So if somebody is reading this, they wouldn't even necessarily know that there was that um, really kind of horrific goal of the whole thing. I, I don't know if that struck anybody else, or if if it is in here, and I just didn't see it but I, I don't see it at all. I have to go back, I'm on Carol's, I apologize, the internet crowd came and we're trying to cut us. <laughs> anyway, I had to go and do, deal with domestic things, but I, I, we need to go and look at, at, at the uh, uh, resolution to see that. Yeah. But we do need to define what it was for people to understand what it is we're apologizing for. And I think that the very first thing of the original one does does address that but it was it was um removed anyway just a just a thought i i had never i hadn't noticed that before until you started talking about kind of what it is and what its aim was and putting that together with judy's testimony here i i just became aware of that but well, it does quote it does quote the act and the purpose of the act, which was to authorize and provide for the sterilization of imbeciles, feeble-minded, and insane persons, rapists, confirmed criminals, and other defective. Yeah, I I do see that, but I anyway. But you know that also doesn't. I mean, it doesn't. They were just going after people who are pauperism, and pauper, paupers, you know, poor people. I mean, that's. No, not uh, those are just regular folks. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I think Judy had a possible contribution. Oh, yeah, yeah. Judy. Judy, you're you're muted. Um nationally, um the the um eugenics programs were to target what they called the three Ds, defective, dependent, and um delinquent and the purpose was to the the slogan i mentioned the purpose was to create a better man so right. the science of the time had been working on creating better racehorses creating cows that gave more milk and things like that and so that's what they felt they could do with people and part of the problem that 
the reason it's so important to get this correct for me now is because there's like 20 things out there, uh, 20 uh, genetic, genetic testing groups like CRISPR um, who are testing. Um, they have a toolbox um, to create designer babies and they're beginning to use it on various things, um, including children. And, um, and it's, so it's important to make it clear what this was doing, what this program was doing, because it hasn't stopped. In the 1960s, President Johnson gave all this money out for Indian Health Services to sterilize any woman who looked to be full blood. Millions of dollars. You, 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 cut, you, you cut out there, who, who what? Um, President Johnson in the 1960s gave out millions of dollars to Indian Health Services to, to sterilize um, indigenous women who looked to be full blood. And the, the hospitals, is, medical center hospital in Vermont, in Burlington, um, they followed the Mount Sinai rule and the Mount Sinai rule, um, the individual institutions would pick a number, just say um, 122. And if you were a 40 year old mother who went in and had three children and you went in to have your fourth child four times your age, if it went over 122, you came out sterilized. And my, that happened to my sister in 1980. So it's important, however you word this, to be clear because it's not stopped. It's still going on today. It just has a different name. And um, I think my friend um, wrote to ask to speak with you, um, uh, Charlene Gallerno. Yes, we have her testimony, I think. Okay. And I, she's from Newfane, right? Yes. Yeah, I told her that um, we she could come in and testify and hopefully she'll be able to come in next week. So her appointment is with Harvard Medical. And yeah. he has taught for decades about eugenics and policies and the impacts of it. And it would be really um, wise for you to hear from her because this apology Apology is narrow. It's only for the Vermont Eugenic Survey, but it happened many, many decades and it's still going on today. So this apology should set a precedent to anybody because we have high schools in the state who are messing around with genes, gene editing through CRISPR. So it, it, you got to make this statement mean something. Whoa, yeah. So um, my guess is that we will once again be making some changes to a house bill. I, I, I can't say that for sure committee, but I just get the sense from, from my other four members that uh, are three members that are here that there needs to be some some more statements in here on different things am i am i right committee is yes okay well i um what want yes senator clarkson i i, I would say the house has done to go to carol's first Point. the house has done amazing work okay. taking this up and i um I'm, I'm really grateful for the amount of time they took and, and i know they took a huge amount of time and effort to get this to us so um i i'm also appreciative for their work yes and i will say that having said that we will probably make some changes it's always easier 
to make changes to something you have in front of you than to start with from scratch. So they, mm-hmm. they really started from scratch and developed something. And whether it was perfect or not, they took a lot of time and a lot of testimony and, and did a lot of work on this. And it is much easier for us to be looking at this and saying, what needs to be added, what needs to be changed, because we're not starting from scratch. So I acknowledge their work also. <clears throat> so Carol and Judy, I'm very, very happy that you that you joined us today. And we are, <clears throat> our schedule is uh, right now a little bit fluid because we're trying to deal with a number of things, but we'll make sure that you get <clears throat> an invite to the next time we take this up again also, even if you feel you have nothing more that you wanna throw in, but to be part of the conversation. And don't you don't have to go now, we're going to hear a little bit from Tanya and um, at four o'clock, we're gonna to shift to a different topic, but Tanya um, Marshall is with us. She's the state archivist and um, she's gonna just give us her words of wisdom. And then next time we take this up, we will also make sure that you all are invited. Okay, Tanya. Thank you, Thank you. Uh, for the record, I'm Tanya Marshall. I'm the state archivist and chief records officer for the state. I also direct the Vermont State Archives and Records Administration. Um, we're the official repository for permanent records of the state. Um, and listening to the testimony on um, this joint resolution a couple of weeks ago, I wanted to reach out to provide um, the committee and others with information about the records that we do have in the state archives that are relevant to the subject. And I do agree with Judy, it's much broader um, than the resolution as worded uh, really understands. So I'm just going to walk through very quickly. I did provide written testimony, mm-hmm. but the following the last parts of the pages actually do have images of some of the records. Uh, so you have a visual um, when I'm talking about them. But I'm going to provide um, some a listing of the different records that we have in the in the archives that I think um, and and also that we are available to the legislature to provide any research that you would like or information. Um, the first set is that it's it's much bigger than a couple of acts um, or proposed legislation. Um, you can go back from 1906 all the way to 1970, and you're going to have legislative acts that are pertinent to this topic that range from communicable diseases marriages license, which are mentioned, children who were quote unquote born out of wedlock, um, in addition to the sterilization. Um, many people do not realize, or maybe you know, dating, when you had to get a blood test, that was based on a, eugenics bills. And Vermont passed one of the first ones in 1915. So although they did not pass the compulsive you know, requirement for certain individuals to be sterilized in 1912, there were a number of other um, uh, legislation that was passed that particular session or right after there that were specifically eugenics and noted um, as eugenics bills. Uh, we do have the records of the eugenics survey. Um, those were uh, transmitted to the state of Vermont in 1952 to one of my predecessors, Only Hill, who was a state archivist and also director of public records. Um, at that point, they were, um, U- University of Vermont was, you know, they were in the attic of the Fleming Museum. Um, it's they were largely quote unquote abandoned. And there's a number of reasons around that 1951, 52 time period to which uh, which uh, nobody wanted to really touch those records and only Hill took them. Uh, included in those records are the records of the Vermont Commission on Country Life. Uh, it's unique in the sense that the commission was not a state uh, commission. It was, um, it was an unofficial commission of the state to serve as a first kind of planning commission. Uh, we have those records as well. Uh, includes um, their minutes, their reports, their publications. It started in 1928. It was chaired by Governor John E. Weeks, um, who was the governor in 1930, um, which is uh, pretty pertinent in terms of a name that comes up as early as 1912. Uh, We also have the record inventories that were created in 1938 through 1942 by the the work Projects Administration, that's a federal historical record survey, so it tells us the details of how many records, uh, what records existed at the time, and we can use those to compare. Um, There was a number of different reports, it's 352 pages uh, related just to eugenic study, or the the eugenic survey, sorry, and the uh, commission. 
Uh, last week, we just accessioned in the archives for the first time. We're doing a large records and information management program, putting on my records management hat with the Agency of Human Services, the sterilization certificates. These were required by law following the 1931 Act to be uh, filed in duplicate with the then Commissioner of Public Welfare. We are indexing them right now. To my best knowledge, this is probably one of the first times that these have been accessed. They have been in storage for a number of years, um, attributed largely to a, a, a different um, agency or department um, that, that uh, originally created them. Uh, they do include correspondence with uh, physicians, overseers of the poor, and others. Um, so these would be the ones that had to be filed in duplicate underneath the law, um, and the other ones would have been filed wherever the, the service, so quote unquote, was done. Um, we are on 117 right now, and we're on H, and they're in alphabetical order. Examples of the sterilization certificates, along with some of the correspondences, including in written testimony. We also have obviously the legislative bills and final acts related to the evaluation, reporting, and registration of mental defects. Davis, that was not required until 1941 by the legislature, um, and that included census. Um, and there's a number of different things that you'll find related to that particular activity um, and requirements put on to uh, the Commissioner of Public Welfare at the time. We also have the case files are incomplete for the various Vermont state institutions. They did change names often, they changed responsibilities often. Um, we can probably track about 25 or 20, 25 to 30 different versions, depending on the time frame from when they were first started. Uh, for most of them, you would recognize them as Brandon Training School, the Wheat School, Vermont State Hospital, Vermont State Prison, and the Women's Reformatory. Uh, we also have the case files of the matters heard and decided by Vermont courts. Uh, we work with one of the only state archives in the country that, uh, or the only state that has all state courts, which means that we have all the municipal, city, um, county, and now the current uh, superior court records. Uh, these would be ones pertaining to involuntary commitments and guardianships. Um, they all, they all play a bigger part in the story here. We have the Supreme Court briefs and printed materials that's including the uh, landmark case that came out and was decided in 1978 related to who could decide on a voluntary sterilization. Uh, we have all the annual and biannual reports um, for the most part for all the different boards and commissions that were required and mandated to report on the different um, activities of the state um, that were in their statutes. We also have the records of elected officials and their administrative departments generally uh, formal correspondence reports and recommendations at all different levels. And more recently in the last couple of years, we've sessioned from the Department of Libraries, the Vermont Newspapers of Record. They are available electronically for people to do research. That's probably the most um, helpful set of records that we have uh, acquired in most recent years. It provides the contemporary perspective of society and legislators and individuals at the time of any of the legislation, even current contemporary. Um, in addition, we have the vital records that we work with Department of Health on, and there's also the federal census that will talk about different um, individuals and, and, um, and who they lived with at what time and, and how. Um, then we also have the publications um, and the legislative directory. So I've outlined those to kind of illustrate that there's, there is a much bigger picture and you could take any form of legislation at any given time. And you, I mean, you could just research on that for decades. <laughs> um, and so I think the key part is for people to know that we, we are available to do that. We're available to provide, you know, the objective records for the legislators to decide how you want to thread them together. Um, the examples, um, and this is more for the question that came up, I provided in the written documentation, um, just an example of state government structure at the time, uh, one comparing 1913 when the legislation uh, failed. This was largely a lot of boards and commissions. There were, you know, departments did not exist in the same way that we think about. And the institutions were buildings. Uh, they had superintendents, their buildings, they operated on their own for the most part, except for having different supervisors, um, which were usually ex officios, governors, um, elected officials. Um, in 1930, by 1931, you see a similar structure to what we have now, um, where you'll have an executive branch with a governor who appoints a commissioner who is um, who is then um, 
you know, uh, with the advice and consent of the Senate. Um, in that case, the, um, the Commissioner of Public Welfare was then to appoint individuals to serve as superintendents. Um, the 1931 structure is interesting because John Weeks was coming out. Uh, he, he was, um, he, he turned over to Stanley C. Wilson. Both of them uh, from the early 1910s had been involved in different institutions through the time um, and had testified and were part of public hearings uh, for decades related to um, different movements. And uh, John A. Weeks does become the first chair of the, I think, first and only chair of the Commission on Country Life. Um, so I included in there the legislative directory from 1931. So it gives you an idea about how the public welfare department um, defined itself based on its uh, statutes. And um, and I should, I didn't include in here, but the State Board of Health really starts coming into play much more um, in that time frame, and, and we see a lot of changes um, in, in terms of that. I also outline, um, starting on page five, is the eugenic survey, and it provides different information of the types of um, uh, forms that were used as part of the survey. Um, it also includes, we have a couple of different copies of Perkins, a resume of 11 years, which I think is very um, insightful and it gives you an idea about um, Dr. Perkins' perspective on that. But, but again, that was, that was a time frame. There's a lot more in terms of legislation and activity that happened after that. Um, I did include on page six, uh, you can see the pedigree charts. You'll see that that one is actually about cost to the towns uh, related to families. And that is exactly what the testimony from Judy and Carol talk about of being, um, um, it, it's about this targeted also poor. It was it is about costs and you do see that in the newspapers as well. Um, and then there's family history components. That's what the survey, um, it's much bigger than that, but those are examples of that. I also have examples of the, um, the country life uh, minutes um, and then also some from the Department of Public uh, Welfare and newspapers. And um, it, my looking at different acts just for a 30 year period, I was up to about 25 or 30 acts that would all intertwine in some way, no. just with the few that you, you had that were passed by the legislature. Not all, some were bills and not passed, but, um, and they all seem to, you get a different picture too about what was happening um, and what kind of instigated or what kind of propelled um, that kind of legislation. So, uh, Jeanette, may I ask a question? Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Tanya, this is incredible. I mean, this is a huge amount of material. I'm just curious uh, on page six, the pedigree chart, which is amazing. The towns aren't listed, but the, uh, I'm just curious what is the cost? Is the cost the operation of sterilizing somebody? Is it the cost of educating people? This, this, was, a, this was not related to sterilization or education. This was considered to be cost that a, an overseer of the poor um, for taking response, quote unquote, responsibility of the family. So this, so some of the focus, and, and I think both um, Judy and Carol got to this, was that it was, it was targeting individuals that were costing money. So it was a cost to the town. It was a cost to the town. And you do see it in legislation is that once the state opened up state institutions, all this that fit a certain, you know, um, uh, for, for certain individuals as defined underneath the laws at the time, a lot of people start shifting and you can, you can trace any individual and you're going to find a different story and it's, and either way, you're going to be sad about it. Um, you know, I would say, you know, really this, so this is not about the sterilization. This is all done largely prior to, um, to that legislation. And, you know, now that we have the certificates, we can definitely, you know, draw some comparisons to see how they relate. Um, but again, we just have a snapshot or we just have what was filed separately with the public welfare. We also have the case files that include that information. Um, but the sterilization is like a whole separate additional form of legislation, um, as is the marriage, you know, um, you know, like I, I got married in Massachusetts and how to get a blood test. That was, that was, that was the earliest part of eugenics. They called it the eugenics marriage bill. And that was a way of, of circumventing a different way. Um, but I think, uh, as Judy mentioned too, you can trace all these things and, you know, some things you might trace and, and perceive as positive, 
um, nowadays. You know, there's not not about the sterilization, but birth control is a good example. And having, um, you know, some things if you really thread them, you're going to fall into the air, all different areas of of what we have for for a state, and that's just the complexity of you know the laws. That's the complexity of society. Um, there's just a bigger picture. And so I do want to offer that we can at least provide different records and, and information to you in, in any way that you'd like that. Um, or if you wanted a, a particular thread to be pulled and, and kind of look at the bigger picture about everything that's around, you know, a particular uh, act, for example, or, uh, a, an, you know, uh, um, th there's all different things that, that you, it, there, it's never ending in terms of what, what's a, what's, what can be pulled on for that. Thank you. <laughs> Judy, did you have a comment? Thank you, Tanya. I do. Thank you, Tanya, for elaborating what I was trying to express. Um, so I want to give you an example of what Tanya is talking about, um, how it spreads to 25 30 acts. So in the legislation today, uh, this before it crossed over, I don't know where it is now, but there was H210. It was a public bill, health bill, and it crossed over to the Senate and it reads um, to give money to the four tribes, the four recognized tribes in that area. Now I testified at that meeting um, the organization that Gadakana that we run in um, this state started 10 years before these tribes were even recognized. We have indigenous people that live in this state who are not a Beneke. And we have some who are a Beneke, they just don't want to belong to those tribes for one reason or another. But the state will not give funding for public health to anybody or many other things as well, to many other um, uh, uh, organizations other than the four tribes. And so the bills just keep compounding um, since there's been this recognition, there are tons of bills that co compound on the problem that the money is not going to many people who need it. And at that house to bill um, organiz uh, meeting, whatever they call it, I spoke out uh, about using $350,000 of rapid response money this past year alone to help people who had no food, they had no money, they couldn't pay rent. And not one penny of that would come from the state. I had to go nationally to get that money. Um, I get calls from agencies all the time. The Department of Labor, Labor frequently calls me. They want me to work with the tribes because they can't give me the money to do the work. They have to give it to the tribe, but the tribe doesn't want me. So it doesn't happen. They give it to the tribe. And it's, as you read in the newspapers, it's often misused. Um, so it's a compounded problem that's been going on forever where it spreads like a cancer to all these other bills. Hmm. Sorry, I was just making some notes. Um, well, um, I would suggest that um, perhaps this is a good um, place to Senator Clarkson? Yeah, I guess the thing, I think this is probably a good stopping spot. You're right. But uh, I guess I'm just puzzled that given all these bills and all this effort for so long since 1906 and before, I mean, Tanya says for, since 1760, there things were, uh, that, there, that, that Tom says there were only 253 documented sterilizations. What it, it sort of surprises me that number is as low as it is, given how much effort was put into uh, a, a, a addressing this group of people. Well, it's because of the way the law was written. You needed right. two doctors to sign. 
And so within right. an institution, the two doctors signed and then, then uh, the certificate was completed. The certificate was mailed to, Tanya could tell you who, the state, someone in the state. Yeah, I can, um, just to uh, uh, Senator Clarkson. So the records in the archives go back to 1760, but not specifically on this subject. Um, and the, the, the 250 number actually comes from um, uh, Dr. Clarence um, Gamble, Dr. and Gamble. Um, he published something in 1948 that came up with that number. State officials, even in, you know, shortly thereafter, disputed whether or not that was correct. Um, and it did have, you know, so, so part of it was that, you know, the filings that had to go to the Commissioner of Public Welfare, even the Commissioner of Public Welfare in 1951 said he didn't really know too much about it. And, and he wasn't really sure what those numbers were, they were able to provide and I do have them, uh, what they were reporting in terms of numbers um, per year, um, in different reports and so forth. But I think that number isn't quite known, which is why we're really indexing and walking through them now that we've accessioned at least a full set of, you know, one copy. Now we can compare them to what kind of certificates do we see inside case files from some of the different institutions and are they they're not supposed to overlap the sense would be that you know if it was through a state institution those are actually maintained by the state institution and those numbers are around 150 to 160 um, so I don't think we quite know but we possibly could if now with additional you know centralization of these kinds of records and the ability to to do some searching we may be able to get a better number and that's something that my staff is currently working on so that we can provide that because i think it is of, of you know state interest yeah and didn't judy also say that if it was done not in an institution that there wasn't that certificate so there wouldn't be a record well, yes. no, those were required. Those were the ones that were required to be sent oh. to the Commissioner of Public oh. Oh, Welfare. Were, and they okay. were the records that had been kind of just sitting in storage for, for oh. decades. And I don't know right. yet how they really compare to the other certificates that are on file. Okay. Um, but those would be for overseers of the poor. They could, you know, there was different ways of billing. So there's an accounting trail. It's all about who pays. All about who um, and and uh, uh -huh. there were a lot of people who did want to be, you know, and there's enough evidence there that people did want to actually, uh, you have to think this predates a lot of birth control. There were people who did, and they were very clearly told, no, this, this bill is very specific and the state will only pay if, if this, um, but we've seen a lot of examples already in the certificates that they don't add up. Right. Things don't add up, um, and 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 I think that's what we'd expected to see. But we're we're going to pull out, you know, more of that information for you. Right, and that's where the numbers will increase is when you start getting into those private institutions that under HIPAA law you couldn't go directly to find the info the answer to. So, um, like for instance, in Burlington there was a place called the Home for Friendless Mothers. And that's where women went who had children who um, were unwed. And um, where are their numbers? You know, Judy, yeah. I think we actually are finding those in this new box that we just acquired awesome. because I we're seeing we're seeing the same doctors over and over and over. Exactly. And now we're now we're we're indexing them on based on who signed it, who notarized, uh, who authorized, because in some cases it's guardians. And we're also finding dates that, you know, I just found a uh, there are 13 year olds um, in this index and researching some of them. Uh, the certificate states that his parents signed on it on August 7th of 1937, I believe. His mother died on August 1st. Yeah, yeah. It but the newspapers oh, show his family traveling with another woman to Brandon Training School that week. Um, and I suspect that that's, that it was somebody else who signed on the certificate. So it gives you a, a really good sense when you pull all these parts together how to pull the real but they're like I said they're they're all different they're all different with different circumstances um but the common theme which I think Judy said is that you're poor you're poor and that and, and on public assistance in some way and that became a key part and, but all the circumstances for being poor are going to vary significantly by right. each family and it's subjective because many of the people they deemed as poor did not see themselves as poor. Um, it, it, there's so much subjectivity put into this um, on all levels. That's why it was declared a pseudoscience. 
Yeah. So I am going to, <coughs> excuse me, um, switch gears here a little bit. And I, again, really want to thank Judy and Carol for coming forward and giving their stories, your stories. And, um, and ask you if to come again next time we do this, because I think that your wisdom will um, continue to inform us about where we go and what we might do. And I will make the comment that the state of Vermont is very lucky to have Tanya Marshall as our archivist because uh, she, she really takes all of this seriously and is, um, I just, I can't say how lucky we are to have her as the archivist um, to. Uh, Thank you, I appreciate that. You are welcome. It's our, a hidden treasure deep in the bowels. <laughs> of the state archives. And if you haven't been to the state archives, we I would suggest a visit once we are able to um, go places and actually see real people. It, it's, a, it's an amazing building. And Tanya took us um, through it once a number of years ago, and I'm sure it's more now. And it's, there's, it's like a huge warehouse and there's piles and piles and piles and piles and boxes and stuff everywhere. And she knows where they all are. I know. Well, we're, we're organized. We're organized. <laughs> That's the key, right? <laughs> it's an amazing so you might take a trip there sometime if you haven't been. Well, I, I hope we have a field trip because some of us weren't on the committee when you did that last one. Uh, well, love to have you. It's an amazing place. You really should see it. Yeah. I take it, Judy, you used it quite a bit for your research. Hundreds of times. This started for me in high school. I was a junior in high school and my required reading was We Americans by Ellen Anderson. Oh. And I recognized my family in the book. And when I talked to the teacher about it, she said, my dear, this is a textbook. You have to believe what's written in the textbook. And so it started a lifelong journey for me. And um, Nancy Gallagher came to a presentation I was doing and I met her and then we researched together um, for at least 25 years. Um, and Nancy's book, if you have the opportunity to read Breeding Better Vermonters, yep. that will give you a lot of amazing statistics. I know Nancy would be here um, if she could, but she's dealing a lot with the loss of her sister right now. Yeah, we heard that. We had her on the list, but she said she couldn't come because she was. Yeah. Okay, so committee, I'm going to switch our focus here, although it's um, hard to do because I, this is a very oh. um, intriguing issue, and I and we will learn more about it next week, and I apologize for not being able to tell you exactly when, but I'm trying to juggle schedules here and meet everybody's needs. But Gail will send you an invitation to all three of you who are here today and to those who couldn't come. We'll hope that it doesn't snow next time so that Carol Irons can yeah. meet with us and um, other, other folks also. So. Thank you. And you're certainly welcome to stay. We're going to talk about pensions and retirement now, and it's going to be riveting. So you're welcome to stay. But if you don't, that's we understand. Good luck with that. <laughs> Thank you. Thank don't you mess so with much. my pension, all right? I'm a, no. I'm a retired state, so don't mess okay. with okay? All right. Well, your guy is right there. <laughs> well, thank you so much for everything. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you, Carol. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, Tanya. <laughs> Phew, that was that was amazing. Yeah, and um, okay, so I think we uh, have some uh, not marching orders, but I think we have some um, issues that we need to get into.
more thoroughly here on this. So I, I did, oh, there's Becky. <coughs> So Becky, if you want to, and I know um, you sent it to me, Gail has it. Um, it she didn't post it yet because um, we wanted to, uh, excuse me, wait until we got to committee. So uh, Gail, if you want to um, put that up now on, on the website, on the committee page. I will do that. Thank you. And it's then it's going to take a couple of minutes, but uh, it should be there shortly. Right. And then I think so. What we have to do is if you're on the committee page committee, you have to refresh your page. And I forget how to do that. Oh, that's a little arrow up at the top. Yeah. <clears throat> so in a couple minutes, we will. <clears throat> so for those of you who just joined us, we are looking at the. Um, Apolo the resolution that apologizes for the General Assembly's role in the eugenics survey. And um, I, to perhaps others, but I today learned a lot more about what this is and what it entailed and what, um, <clears throat> and where we might go with this. So right. that's what we were. That's what we were looking at. And it's, um, I have to say this year and last year, I, some of the issues that we've been dealing with are, are um, very heavy and um, disheartening issues. I mean, a lot of them are, but and very, this one, and this very one issues, the, the children at St. Joseph's, the, the whole, Thing of child pornography and human trafficking and burn pits and <sighs> anyway. So Gail, just tell us when you have that up. <clears throat> yeah, I have to convert it. So it's uh, just taking a minute here. Okay. And moving, I mean, it, it's really the, the human, the story of Vermont intertwined with these lives, just, just mm -hmm. very moving and just, oh. And it, yeah. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm just sitting here. It's just, I'm feeling a little overwhelmed by the what we were just listening to. And I'm just, oh, Senator Collimore, welcome oh. back. Thank you, Madam Chair. Hi, you, that was an incredible testimony on the eugenics piece, which we will fill you in on. Okay. Okay, it should be there. So everybody just refresh, refresh your page and it should be at the top. Actually, it won't be at the top because it's under Rebecca Wasserman. Do they, are they alphabetical? Um, <clears throat> under today's documents? Yeah. If we refresh. And there's, I only see one thing on oh, the proposed amendment. Oh, there it is. I'm posting the link on chat. Okay, but it's the proposed okay. amendment, right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. yeah, that's all that's all I had submitted. Yeah. So if you um Becky, if you want to walk us through this, um sure. Senator Colomore, we are just for your information, we're just switching. We just finished with the um testimony on the uh, resolution, and then we're just starting the retirement one. Okay. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, so Becky Wasserman, Legislative Council. Um, I uh, so I wasn't sure how to present us how how it would be moving. So I just um, put it rather than an amendment format. It's just um, sort of in proposed language format and I can make it however the committee decides to go forward with it. Um, um, I think that's smart anyway, because we haven't made any final decisions, so it doesn't make any sense to, you know. Okay, so this is um, some proposals for H449, which is the, um, the <clears throat> bill that is amending the membership and duties of the of the of VPIC and also creating the pension um, task force. So I've highlighted in yellow where there are changes from uh, H449, which has not quite passed the house, but uh, <laughs> passed second reading just now. Um, so uh, these were, um, the first set of changes is in section one, um, which as you will recall is where the VPIC language is. Um, so if I'm realizing now I don't have page numbers, which is completely unhelpful to you. <laughs> um, so I will try to figure out, I think it is page um, four of uh, the 24 page document. Um, so the first change that I made here was to the uh, membership terms uh, for uh, the commission. Um, so in the, the language, it said um, there was some language starting on, page, on line 20 that um, referred to members and alternates being re eligible for reappointment to the commission. Um, but they couldn't serve for more than three years. And the uh, service of alternates were ca counted towards the sort of total amount that could be served. Um, so this new language is, is um, being changed to say that just a single term served as an alternate um, uh, shall not be used to calculate a member's total term limit. Any questions? Um, okay. Um, next page, page five. Um, still in the member term section. Uh, so the members of the committee serve for serve for four year terms, um, not more than three terms. The chair has different term limits. Um, so the the bill originally had twenty years. I understand that you all wanted to perhaps change that term limit. So I just left it blank for now um, until you come up with a, a direction on how you wanna proceed with that. Yes, thank you. Um, <clears throat> subsection G, uh, D on page five, um, the, this deals with chair, the chair and the vice chair of the committee. Um, so I have amended the language here to clarify that um, the chair of, of VPIC has to have certain qualifications. And so the, the chair of the commission has to have the financial investment leadership and governance, governance expertise as required by policies adopted by the commission. Um, and I believe you all heard from Tom Galanka yesterday who um, presented the policies that state this. So this is an attempt to cross-reference which the policies that are adopted by the committee, by the commission. And, and just committee, I can't, I can't see anybody. I actually, I'm gonna put on my iPad so that I can see you. But if you have any questions, um, <clears throat> just uh, speak up please. And, um, and just for your information, Tom did work with Becky around this language. <coughs> Um, okay, so the next change is in um, section three of the bill, which is on page, uh, starts on page 12, but the change is on page 13. Um, so section three of the bill deals with some uh, fiscal year 22 reports that VPIC will be submitting. In subsection B, um, the the commission is hiring an independent third party to 
review the operations of the commission and look at how to make it um, the original language used the terms a standalone entity and the change here is um, to an independent entity. Which, as I understand, it didn't make any any um, substantive change, but it just felt better to have it consistent to me. <laughs> yeah, so that that language independent is now um, consistent with the new statutory language that VPIC is an independent commission. Yeah. Okay. So, sorry, I, I, I've now lost you. Uh, so this is section three on page 13 of the bill. Yeah, we don't have pages, as you know. So I've um, got the chair and it, it'll be yellow, so it'll pop out. Oh, got it. Thanks. Yeah, and I'm sorry, I did not realize there were no page numbers on this. Um, so I'm looking at the page numbers just through the, the PDF uh, viewer on the top, so if that's helpful. Um, so then we can jump again. The next change is not till section 10, which is the section that is creating the task force. And I have this as um, page 18. Um, so the changes that I uh, was asked, were asked to make um, first have to deal with the membership of the task force. So the membership um, has changed from, there were three members of each body, legislative body, the House and the Senate, and that has changed to one current member of, of each of the House and the Senate. Um, I received a language. Oh. Um, so there were some um, commissioners on the committee. Uh, I changed this, the, the request was to change it to two members who shall be appointed by the governor. This doesn't have any um, description of sort of qualification or uh, experience that these members should have. So, um, or that it would be a, a state employee. So I just wanted to point that out. I don't know if the committee wants to consider adding some language around who the governor would be appointing. Mm -hmm. um, Oh. The, yeah. the state treasurer is being added, state treasurer designee, um, and that was, and then there's still uh, two members of the, appointed by the NEA, two members appointed by the uh, VSEA, and then one um, from the Troopers Association. Um, on the next page, subdivision C, there was a request to say that um, any member that appointed a designee um, have that person be the only representative of that designator to participate. So it had referenced a couple of the members on the committee and the reason it only referenced, I think it was three members was because only three members of the committee had had the ability to appoint a designee. Um, not all of them do. Um, so it wasn't, so the request was to give this ability to everybody. So I wasn't sure if the committee wanted uh, everybody to have the ability to have a designee. That's not usually the case. Um, so right now with these changes that have been made, the state treasurer is the only one that who has a, a designee on there. Um, so it would only make sense in the context of the state treasurer now. Um, so I just wanted to point this out um, for a sort of a committee decision on that. I, th I think the question was, do we need this here at all? Because normally when a person is appointed to a committee, they are the ones that attend the committee. And the, some people had the um, idea that we should um, make sure that everybody who appoints somebody, whether it's a designee or not, if the NEA appoints they're two people or three people or whatever, that it's the same people all the time. So it wasn't just for the designee. Okay, so I think this um, was meant to be just for designees. Yeah. Um, I think the I, I think if somebody is appointed to the committee and doesn't have a designee, there shouldn't be an ability for them to, for another person to be in their place. Yeah. Um, 
you know, I, I don't know that this is necessary if it's just the state treasurer now that has this ability. So you could take it out. Um, it, it's not, it's definitely not typical language for uh, study committees. Yep. Okay. We'll have that conversation. Okay. As we will all of them. <laughs> okay. Um, so next in subsection C, we're moving on to the powers and the duties of the committee of the task force. Um, so the first uh, power that was listed had to do with the task force setting a pension stabilization target number. Um, and there was a suggestion to change that to um, the task force developing and evaluating strategies for the state employees retirement system and the teachers retirement system that works to reduce those um, two numbers, the, the, the actuarial accrued liability and the ADAC by the amount that it increased um, between the years fiscal, fiscal year 21 and 22. So rather than referencing um, setting a pension target stabilization number, it um, is looking at developing strategies to reduce those numbers instead. Thanks. Okay. This is what you worked on with Chris, right? That's correct, yes. Thank you. <clears throat> um, the next change is in subdivision C on the next page. Um, so subdivision C is looking at uh, benefit and funding benchmarks. Um, so I, ch I changed here proposed, uh, sorry, new benefit structures to proposed benefit structures uh, with the ob objective of adequate benefits within the established cost containment benchmarks and added in um, when looking at a shared risk model, looking at that model for both employers and employees. Um, on the next page, um, so just for context, there were, uh, I was asked to include some of the recommendations, I believe from Jeff uh, Fannin. Um, so these are, these reflect uh, those, those propo that proposed language. Um, so in subdivision D, evaluating the intermediate long-term economic impacts of the, to the state and local economies. Um, I added in here because of any proposed changes to current, um, excuse me, benefit structures and contribution characteristics and their potential effects on retiree spending power, including retirees who identify as female and retirees who are persons with disabilities. Um, subdivision F, I struck out that subdivision. Um, I need to double check what that was. Um, and I'll it was about um, looking at a defined benefit plan. Defined, right, right, defined benefit, I mean, thank you. Um, and instead, um, I have included here an examination of the effects of current benefit structures and contribution characteristics, characteristics on recruitment and retention of public school educators and state employees and evaluation of any proposed changes to current benefit structures and contribution characteristics on the recruitment and retention of school educators and state employees in the future. Um, subdivision I um, changed the, this language um, was specific in subdivision I to OPEB. Um, so it just it now is referring to a plan to study health benefit design innovations. Um, state regulatory measures and alternate ways of providing pooled health care benefits to both active and retired school employees to lower health care costs for employees, retirees, school boards, and the state. Um, subsection E is the assistance section. So in subdivision uh, 1A, uh, the state treasurer was providing administrative, technical, and legal assistance. Um, this has changed to Ledge Council. Um, I just noted here that Ledge Council would not be providing, wouldn't be the appropriate um, office to provide technical assistance. And 
the the task force is hiring an outside legal advisor. So um, we would we would be able to work on you know contracting for that those advisory services. But just I think we just wanted some clarification on what assistance ledge counsel would be providing. Um, and the administrative assistance is not provided by ledge counsel anymore. I think that is more reflected in C where the committee support services are, are done through the Office of Legislative Operations. Hmm. Right. Um, so, so just wanted to kind of get clarification on, on what services uh, we would be providing here. Mm -hmm. um, and then moving on to the next page, subsection G for report. So the report is pushed, an interim report is pushed um, out to October 15th of 2021 um, with an update on the work of the, the task force. And then December 2nd would be the final report. Um, and that was the last change. All right, so um, anybody want to weigh in on any of these <coughs> changes? Senator Collimore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Can I just ask, um, Becky, if you can go back to the um, assistance that the task force, I'm just trying to clarify in my mind. It says on line 16 that the, the task force shall have legal assistance from the Office of Ledge Council but then it says ledge council would not be able to provide technical or legal assistance. And I, I'm confused with that. What does that mean? Um, this was just more a note because my, my notes were to change office of the state treasurer to office of the ledge council. So I just wanted to note that um, we wouldn't necessarily like the, the form of the legal assistance that I think we would be providing is um, is to give us the authority to contract for there's some there's some advisory services that the task force is is going to need to contract for and i think maybe that language needs to be cleaned up that that would be done by for example ledge council that's on the top of page the next page subdivision two um so it's not the task force necessarily that would be contracting for those advisory services um, but I think the idea in the in that subdivision too is that the task force is actually going to be hiring an outside law firm to provide um, legal assistance. So I think more that I was just more pointing out that I think the language needs to be cleaned up to say exactly what what role we would all be playing in the task force. Right. Okay. Thank you. I think the thought was that <clears throat> you're our, you're the attorneys for the legislature and and um, you wouldn't be the attorneys for the task force but but for the legislative members I mean to be able to reflect on that and I don't know what what was even meant in the original bill by technical assistance I don't know what that meant I think organizing well I would assume it meant pulling meetings together notifying, I mean, a lot of the organizing. Well, that's, I would, I put that under administrative, not. Yeah, yeah I think, I think technical assistance was more for the treasurer in terms of uh, sort of technical assistance in helping with, you know, this, uh, the structure of the retirement system and, and answering specific questions related to retirement systems, which is why I say, I don't think our office would be that, mm -hmm the office to provide that. That being said, the language is contemplating in two that, that the committee would be hiring, you know, a benefits expert. So, you know, maybe that is where, and, and, and they'd be working with an actuary. So I think maybe that's where that technical assistance is actually coming from. That, that's probably true. Would you, would you agree with that, Beth? Beth, you're muted. She's trying. You can hit the space bar or the little thing oh, on the bottom. Are. You're all okay. I'm, I'm good at this. You know, I, I don't think that oh, technical assistance really was about the actuarial work and scenarios and, and, and that piece. And I and I 
I don't think we want to, we don't necessarily, I'd be happy to not do anything on that, but uh, we don't necessarily um, want to exclude us from that. You know, I talked about having Chris work with us. Uh, you know, we can be part of that if, if you want. I just don't want to take on the whole burden. And we talked about perhaps Chris working with us on that. Um, uh, uh, and, uh, you know, kind of a joint thing on those fiscal and I would say actuarial work. You're going to need to work, use the word actuarial someplace in there that uh, the kind of work that needs to be done on this. So you're going to need to either hire one or use ours. And uh, uh, which, you know, you can do an amendment. Certainly you can do what we, you did last time, which has had, uh, or a house did, have um, uh, Chris get an allocation and use our actuary. Um, but um, it's up to you. We're not averse to being part of that. We just didn't want to do all the technical, all the legal, all, you know, and all the actuarial work and then take the minutes and, and warn it and all that stuff. We didn't feel that we had the, um, the person power to do that. Mm -hmm. Allison? Yes, that was actually the comment I was going to make before Beth spoke, which is, uh, I believe Beth had offered that her committee could sort of be on a, a, a consulting basis. I don't know what we, how we want to, but that you said you didn't want to take on the whole burden of all that, but that you would certainly be on call if needed. And I don't know how, the language that we want to develop around that, but it would be nice to at least identify that we could call on the treasurer's office. They could always say no but for whatever we're asking, but that you want, that you were willing to uh, be viewed as a resource. Yeah. Um, well, I, she's on the, she would be on the committee. So of course she's a resource. Of but course, I didn't mean her, I meant her office. Her office, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I'm interrupting, my apologies. No, that's fine. I, I was the one that interrupted. I think two says the task force may contract for advisory services from an independent benefits expert and legal expert as necessary. Does that cover the actuarial That's benefits expert? Benefits legal issue, legal consultation. You know, is this is a is this discrimination? Is this legal? Does it meet IRS right. requirements? Um, and what are you? What are the parameters of what you can and can't do um, based on cur certain court uh, actions in either this state or elsewhere? What's the trend in these things? I think that you need to. I think you should identify actuarial services um, and that uh, to be coordinated. Uh, with uh, with the treasurer's office and joint fiscal, and we can yeah. we can use mine. They can use their own. Although using your own, it would take you two years to catch up to the nuances of our system. Um, but we'd be happy to coordinate and work with JFO. Coordinate and work with the actuary. We just weren't in the position. We didn't have as I said, so the person everything here. Yeah, and I, I think the language can actually be. Uh, as the treasurer just mentioned, can actually be changed to clarify that the consulting services you're hiring would be more, would be actuarial benefits and legal expertise. Um, it's, so I, I don't think it actually captures everything right now that is needed. Um, that being said, uh, you know, not to be the bearer of bad news, I'm not sure $200,000 is, is the appropriate amount for that, but I can let someone else speak to whether that would cover all of the, the expenses that are needed. Um, but I do think that based on, I do think that JFO would need to use the treasurer's actuary right now, as she just mentioned, to have, to be up to date on everything. And I think the language doesn't exactly reflect that. Well, we should then probably do that. The, uh, Becky, who would we ask to get a better guesstimate on the amount we should put in if it's not 200,000? Um, I'm gonna say JFO, Steve Klein or, or Chris might might be able to. I, I've, I've sort of emailed them trying to get a better number, but I think that they would be able to provide a little bit um, more of a, of a, of a better number for the committee to consider. Okay. We'll get that from them. I'm sorry again, my apologies. No, go ahead. Uh, as I mentioned uh, yesterday, uh, the last study was someplace in the 75 to 100,000. Right. I think it might've been 100 and we used 75. Um, obviously costs are higher than, um, I think 200 is probably reasonable. You might wanna just hedge, hedge yourself a little bit and put 250. Uh, All right. Let's. I would suggest you 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 verify and 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 do a 
you know, a, a test of, uh, of whether that makes sense uh, with JFO as well. Okay. Yeah, we, we will do that. We will ask. Can and I, and I, oh, sorry. No, go ahead, Becky. Um, and I, I would also suggest that I, I think the language does have to be updated with respect to the task force main contract for services. So I, really, I think that's Ledge Council or JFO yes. has to do that work. So, um, and the, the money would be appropriated to one of them to or to the legislative branch to, to contract for those services. So I, I think that appropriation language needs to be cleaned up as well. Yep, I think you're right. So committee, if I can go up to a change that hasn't, we haven't even discussed, but was brought up to us. Um, and I don't remember the gentleman's name who oh, sent name it. John Pelletier. Okay. So if you go up to the very beginning under in, in under definitions, yep. the um the oh. On C, under the definition of a, an independent person, he pointed out how, how independent are you if you, all you have to do to maintain your, to say you're independent is to sign, um, provide uh, a disclosure to, I mean, to say something to the committee, the other members of the committee. Does that really make you, um, I, I, now I'm reading this, it doesn't. Um, it, sorry, that, that is just for if the person's, like if a family member yeah, but is, is a in beneficiary of the system, then the person who's actually being appointed to the task force could still be considered independent if they're not a beneficiary. Um, if, it, if, they're an, if they're a beneficiary. Oh, yeah. uh, okay. Okay. That, that, but the problem with that, and I agree with John, is that th that means you could be totally dependent on, on that retirement income. I mean, you could be planning your future dependent on that. On that. I mean, that does not make you an independent person in what, any way, shape, or form, I think. So I, I, I actually think that should be that C should be struck. I, I, well, I, I, I'm not sure that if you're an in-law that you should be disqualified. Um, have a, there's an interest. I mean, there's a self interest. I mean, what if that's your sister and you, or your brother and you know that the future, their future financial uh, planning was dependent on this. I, I actually okay. think this, this is something for us to consider anyway. Eric, did you want to weigh in on that? I think the treasurer had her hand up first. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Treasurer Pierce. Yeah, I think we're on the same page on this. Um, um, uh, I believe the House has actually um, raised this issue as well, and it may have been already um, part of their um, trying to listen. And by the way, uh, when I'm trying to listen to all this legalese, I, I get a little confused. I'm better with numbers and um, um, certainly uh, don't want to um, get into Becky's world ever. But um, I think the issue was the independence for employees that are the three employee boards um, meet, needs to make sure that and they can disclose. Um, you, you're going to have employees that, um, uh, uh, and members who already are members of the system, and they may have a relative in disclosing that. When you get to the financial expert, uh, the two gubernatorial candidate, um, appointees, uh, the idea was to be an expert and independent. And independent means something a little different there is what I'm hearing that folks want. I think that's what uh, um, um, uh, you folks are, are getting at, um, and uh, uh, Senator Clarkson's uh, nodding her head yes. And I think that makes some sense. Again, getting back to what I said uh, yesterday, if the treasurer is, is a new treasurer and you've got a new governor and uh, they, they are more interested in politics than, um, than, than um, stewardship on this, um, and I hope that never happens, just for the, for the record, and I don't think it happens now in either case. Um, I think that you would want an expert there that is not associated, not uh, with the system. So I think the definition of independence needs to say four employ, uh, members of uh, the empl employee members of the board, or, or how you define that, members that were appointed by the employee members of the board, um, 
the definition is fine um, and um, and exclude and say for the for the um, um, uh, the gubernatorial appointees, independence would also mean that they're not um, um, they they do not have a financial interest in the in the benefits. Um, I don't know how you do that, Becky. Um, <laughs> But I, I think the on, the only place the term independent is used is in the gubernatorial appointments. So it's already that's the only place in this whole bill where the term independent is used. No, so this so. whole section on uh, the definition of independent refers to those two those gubernatorial appointments. It's the only place it's referred uh, to. I believe there's also, um, if an interim chair is appointed, yeah. that person has to be a financial expert or independent. And independent, yeah. yeah. And, but it doesn't refer to the other boards or anybody else. Okay. No, no, right. it's it's really just limited to the financial experts uh, that are that are brought on. And I so I I actually w w support the idea of get of of striking that. C. Okay. Um, and speaking of that section, um, it says financial expert or independent. And I think that that should say financial expert and independent. I think that oh. that was the intent. And I think that's just a typo. Means an individual, are, uh, are you uh, in? That's in the, the chair, the interim chair section. It well, says or. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Where you have the X and it says who should be a financial expert or independent. And I think you want the chair to be financial expert and independent. Yes, you're, I think you're right. Yeah. And if I could um, 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 presume on you one more change. Well, let's just talk about this one, finish with this one first. Yeah. Just um, so for the next iteration, is there agreement to take out? C on that so that it's clear that the gubernatorial appointees to VPIC have to really be independent. Yes. Yes. Senator Colomar? Yeah, I guess so. I'm still trying to get caught up here. Um, what, what does that do to change anything? It, it doesn't. It just Not means really. that the gubernatorial appointees really have to be independent. They can't say, um, well, I'm going to sign a thing that says that my, my spouse is getting, my spouse is a beneficiary, and I'm going to disclose that, and that makes them independent. Okay. By, by just, by just, um, uh, admitting to a conflict of interest doesn't make you independent. You have right to truly exactly. be independent. Exactly. Chair, can I ask a question? Yeah. Does this effectively end the terms of people already appointed? And there's a transition period in there. Okay. In oh, the bill. Someone remind me where that is. Um, should be it toward section section two of the bill. Um, I, I do get... have page numbers because I'm looking at it in a PDF reader. Okay, so uh, that is, sorry, let me scroll down there. Um, it is on page 12. Section two. Yeah, I think they were actually pretty clear about the transition from yeah, the current members to the... Yeah, transition of member terms. Okay. All right, so um, anybody else have any comments on that portion of it or where we are right now? Okay. Um, Ma Madam Chair? Yes? I apologize, but I have to leave in about nine minutes. Just giving- oh, I do. I do too. We no, we are scheduled to end at at five. Okay, great. Sorry. So, uh, um, given this subject, we could be here all night. No, we are scheduled to end at five. I just wanted to make sure that we all um, saw this draft that Becky has put together, and that and then on 
tomorrow we will actually take testimony and talk about the, the changes that she's drafted. We're not gonna do that today except to ask kind of technical questions about what does this mean and what does this mean? We're not going to get into the details of it because we have to leave in um, now eight minutes. Uh, uh, Madam Chair, I think our treasurer has a question. Her hand is up. Oh. I, I saw that. Um, oh, okay. so, thank you. I don't know if this qualifies as a technical. I think it does. I think it's section 5472. There's a line 19. And it says the treasurer with the approval of the board and the commission shall adopt by rule standards of contact, uh, conducts for the trustees and employees of the board. Um, and I think that that's, not, I think since um, we, when you spin this off, we won't be um, 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 doing those rules and policies. So I think, and again, I, I, I'll leave it to Becky, but I think that uh, the the treasurer will assist because we're staffed to the um, to the board of trustees. But with respect to VPIC, they would develop their own rules and standards of conduct um, and just separate those two because that's the, the intent of this. And it would be kind of crazy for me to be developing their standards of conduct. I'm a member, but I'm not I'm not the uh, staff support to that. Yeah, that. That actually is reflected in the language. So this section is just dealing with um, the rules as pertain to the boards. Oh, okay. um, the v, the VPIC uh, rules, and I can point you to the page, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, the VPIC policy section um, in section one have now been updated to reflect that VPIC will be uh, adopting their own policies with respect to standards of conduct. Um, so okay. that is on, um, sorry. <laughs> The no page numbers is a problem. Um, <laughs> I believe that, okay, find that shortly. I see something in section seven. Yeah, it's on page nine, subsection D. Okay. Um, so it's in section um, 523. Uh, in line 15? Line, fif line 14, subsection D. Um, there's a, a, a new subsection entitled policies. So it has the commission, um, the, the commission is going to adopt, adopt standards of conduct for members and employees of the commission. Okay. Appreciate that. Thank you. Any no. other, before we have to leave, any other uh, clarifications that we need here? And then tomorrow we're going to... Um, I quite honestly don't remember what we're doing tomorrow, but we're doing this. We're getting testimony. Yeah. In so we'll. Um, Madam Chair, would you like me to make the changes that we just discussed now for tomorrow, or just hold off on making any changes until you discuss uh, it? You mean ta like taking out C and and the yeah yeah you might as well so that we have them all together kind of. Sure. Okay. Okay. Great. Thank you. Um. So. I um, apologize for not taking testimony this afternoon, but I wanted to make sure that everybody saw the, the proposals and got a chance to ask questions about um, the what they meant and clarifications of them. And I think that I don't see any other questions. So what I'm going to do is say goodbye <laughs> and, um, because I have a meeting at five and I really need to take a little tiny break before, before that. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. And we'll see you all tomorrow.